Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark will stop the light from getting through? We do. And do you wish that you could see Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Does the Father truly love us? He does. And does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. And does our God intend to dwell again with us?
righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Your sins run deep. Your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you Uh, let us pray now. Join me in a, in a time of pastoral prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we praise you for your sovereignty and mercy and your grace. And you alone are glorious and worthy of all of our praise, Lord. Lord, we praise you. You have all authority in heaven and on earth. And we as your people find our refuge in you. And I thank you that during this time, we have that, um, that confidence in your strength, Lord, not our own. God, you are light, and in you is no darkness at all. And we praise you for revealing to us that uh, who you are and your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for revealing to us uh, our sin and that it is our sin that separates us from you, but not that we're stuck in sin. Um, but that you sent Jesus Christ to cleanse us from sin. And we confess our sin before you now, Lord, knowing that uh, we have not loved you or worshipped you as we should. We have not sought you um, or sought to live the holy life that you have called us to live. Um, and we have not loved our neighbors as we are called to love our neighbors or our enemies um, as you call us to. Lord, forgive us for living our lives selfishly. Uh, forgive us for living our lives in fear. Forgive us for living our lives on our own and not seeking your word or not seeking your guidance in prayer. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would forgive us for doing this. In our confession, we praise you that uh, you, we don't have to sit in that sin, though, Lord. We thank you that you give us forgiveness, that you sent your son to die for us, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Even today, we are still applying the, your blood to our sin, covering all of our failures and making us look more and more and more like you. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you for your forgiveness. And Lord, would you move us to seek your forgiveness more and more, that we would understand that we have the grace of the gospel. We have Jesus Christ. We can confidently come to you uh, knowing that you will forgive us and you have forgiven us and you have covered us. And we can come to you and know that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we want to reflect you, Lord. We want to bring you glory um, in everything that we do. So we pray that you would move our hearts toward you. Lord, we thank you that your word is still going out, that your people are still gathering, even if it's virtually. Um, we ask that you would bless the ministry of your church as we seek to bring you glory, uh, as we seek to grow in faithfulness. Even if we're having to do this on our own, Lord, we thank you um, that you are making this possible. And we ask that you would continue to bless us. Lord, we praise you for providing for us financially during these times and how you have spurred your people uh, to keep tithing. Even when times are uncertain, uh, your people are still saying, we trust you. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the faith that you have given us because we believe that you are our great provider. We do not have to worry. Father, we ask for those in our congregation who are hurting. God, that, would you please bring them relief? Would you bring them relief from their pain? For those who are sick, would you bring them healing? For those who are weary, would you bring them rest? For those who are anxious and depressed, would you help them to find their, their joy? God, we pray that you will be with your people, that you will raise us up, help us to continually have our hope in you. Father, we pray for the marriages, that you would keep our couples and their eyes on you, that you would drive them to worship together, to pray together, to read your word together. We pray for families, that you would calm the tensions and help us to look to you for all of our needs we have many frustrations right now with the unknown and with having to do homeschool. And, and we ask that you would bring peace and wisdom. Uh, help us to come together as a family, not be torn apart during this time. Lord, we pray for those who are lonely, that you would comfort them in, in their souls through your spirit, through your word, through your church, Lord. You're the great comforter, and you give us comfort so that we could comfort one another. And I thank you for that, Lord. Help us to do that. Father, we ask that you would rid this planet of COVID-19 and the, the COVID-19 virus and protect us in the meantime. Would you guard us? Would you keep us healthy? We know several. Um, I know several personally, and I know some throughout the congregation know several who have COVID-19, Lord, and we ask that you would heal them, uh, that you would keep them um, safe, that this wouldn't go to the extreme, Lord, but that it, they would be healed and, and be asymptomatic. That's what we pray, Lord. For those who are not asymptomatic, we pray that you would bring healing. Father, would you bless our missionaries during this time as they continue to spread your gospel throughout the world uh, during crisis or not, Lord? I, I pray that you bless their ministries, give them success in all that they do. As they, We have some who are translating, Lord, and we have some who are planting churches and some that are reaching um, all of them, uh, reaching the unreached, Lord. And I pray that you would give them success, help them uh, to have new and, and uh, amazing ways to minister during this time. Open up doors for those missionaries, Lord. Father, we pray for the churches in this area um, as they minister the gospel, that you would give them success in all that they do to glorify your name. I thank you that we live in a place that there are many churches, Lord, and, and I pray that you would give the pastors and, and the elders and the staff and all who are leading wisdom to lead, Lord. Um, help them to glorify you. Lord, we ask that you would grant wisdom to our government officials as they seek to lead in this time of crisis that you would grant uh, wisdom to those who are deciding when things should go back to normal in each state. 
Grant wisdom to those who are seeking a cure. Grant wisdom to all that is involved in this time, Lord. Many things that we don't even know that are going on. We ask that you would give wisdom. Now, Lord, we ask for your grace to be poured out on us as we hear and as I proclaim your word. Help me to speak your word in in your power, not my own, Lord. I cannot do this without you. I acknowledge I can't preach without you. I can't change one heart or one mind, Lord. But I know that you can and that you will. And I believe that. I believe that your word does not return void, Lord. I have that confidence or I wouldn't be here. Holy Spirit, give me boldness to preach. Give me clarity of mind. And give your people ears to hear. Give them the ability to apply this message to their lives and me to apply it to my life, Lord. And, and, um, I thank you. I thank you for this time. Would you save the lost, Lord? Bring those home that come to our mind when we, when we hear the word lost or unbeliever. Save our unbelieving spouses or neighbors or friends or family members. God, we ask you, would you do a mighty work? And we know that you will. We trust you, Lord, in all that you do and how you answer all of our prayers. We trust you and we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Uh, we get to be back in the Gospel of Luke uh, this morning. I feel like, man, we haven't been in the Gospel of Luke for a while because of Easter and all of the other things going on. Um, I'm excited to be back in here, excited uh, to talk about this um, out of the ordinary passage, one that I think we come to often and we're like, I don't know what to do with that, so I'm going to leave it over here and not worry about it. Several weeks ago, if you remember, we started this section in Luke. And the section, it begins in uh, chapter 8, verse 22, goes all the way to 917. And, and what Luke is working to do is show the authority of Jesus over all things. So uh, last time we were in the beginning section of this, in Luke 22 through 25, we saw that Jesus gets in the boat with the disciples. Um, the, the waves and the wind start crashing, and they cry out, we're perishing, Lord. Uh, and he rebukes the waves and the wind, and it calms down, and and Luke has shown us Jesus' authority over all creation, as they say, who is this that can command even the waves and the wind, and they obey him? So we see Jesus' authority there. Uh, Next week, we're going to look at Jesus' authority over sickness and disease, um, and and we're going to see how that works out. But today, uh, we get to see Jesus' authority over the spiritual realm. Now, this is something that's really strange. It's, it's, it's unseen, so it's hard for us to grasp. It's hard for us to understand what's going on. Um, but the reason I believe this is awkward is because we live in an age that has downplayed the reality of the spiritual realm. We have many churches who have fallen into uh, teaching just this moralistic uh, thing, you need to just do what's right. We have churches that have removed uh, words like sin and hell and demon and and Satan from their preaching and teaching because it's, it's um, it's not cool, it doesn't attract the crowds. But it would be foolish for us as a church to uh, not discuss that which is very real in Scripture. That's why I teach through books. Um, Instead of saying I'm going to teach on this topic or this topic, um, I teach through books because it forces us to deal with things that maybe we wouldn't normally deal with. It would be foolish for us to overlook what Scripture shows us. To overlook that which is very, has this powerful influence in this world um, because we don't know where to fit it in our day to day. That would be foolish. The reason so many are enslaved to their sin, torment, their suffering, is because they have failed to see that Jesus has authority to set us free from all that seeks to enslave us. And that's what we're going to see today in our passage. 
So I hope you're in the Word with me. I hope you have your Bibles open. Uh, You know I want you in there. I'm reading from Luke 8. We'll be in verses 26 through 39. I'm reading from the ESV version. You can read from whatever version you want. I just want you in the Word with me. So hear the Word of the Lord. Then they sailed to the country of the Gesineres, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for many a time it had seized him he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert jesus then asked him what is your name and he said legion for many demons had entered him And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they began, or they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of Gerasenes Gerasenes, um, asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. We often come to passages like this and we think this is so far out of what we have experienced in our own lives. We just, we really don't know what to do with demon possession, at least demon possession in this extreme of a case. We need to see uh, the destructive power of the demonic. They, They have much power. But what we need to first ask is, do we really need to even talk about the demonic? Is that old school stuff, or or is that something we should actually talk about? C.S. Lewis, he once wrote, um, There are two equal and opposite errors in which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist and magician with the same delight. Many write off the demonic as not real. Uh, Some make light of the demonic. We have TV shows called Lucifer and Supernatural. They say, well, it's not real, but it is a pretty good story, so we're going to use it. Um, They use it as entertainment. They make light of it. Uh, I remember growing up, there was a movie, or or I think it was a movie called Oh God, You Devil, and um, it was was making light of the the pool between God and Satan. Um, And others have this unhealthy interest in it thinking there's a demon behind every sin and and, uh, every disease and every natural disaster. They write it off as it's got to be the demonic. But if we study the Word of God, if we come to the Word, uh, we're able to come to a, a healthy and a balanced view of the demonic activity in the world. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, 
against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our text today reveals that the demonic is real. If we believe the word of God is true, then we have to believe the demonic is real, that it has influence. And not only is it real, but it is unnaturally powerful. It, it is much stronger. Satan and his demons are much stronger than we are in our humanity. And we need to take this seriously. Just look at how the demon, or the demons, we'll find out, affect this man's life in our passage today. When Jesus stepped out, they met this man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he'd worn no clothes. He didn't live in a house, but lived among the tombs. When, Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he cried out to him, What have you, ha what have you to do with me or, or leave me alone, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. For many a time he seized him and he kept him under guard and they kept him under guard and bound him with chains, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So this demonic made it, I mean, it took over the man's speech. It drove him out into the desert. It, it made him incredibly strong. He would break these chains and the bonds that, that they would chain him down with. It would drive him out into the desert, away from his home, away from um, normalcy. Matthew tells us of his aggression, that he would seize and beat people that come next to him. Mark tells us that he would, he would yell and scream and he would cut himself with rocks and scrape himself. And, and we see that the power the demonic has. But does the demonic still have influence today? Does it still possess people in this way today? I would ask you, have you not considered the influence of evil in the world today? Ephesians 2.2 2, um, tells us that we once walked following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He's influencing the sons of disobedience. Have you not figure, or thought about uh, the demonic's influence over genocide and murder and hate and all these heinous crimes that we can hear about and read about? And, and have you not seen um, or thought about the demonic's influence over the psychotic or the unhinged or over things like sex trafficking or, or abuse? There's stuff that is just unspeakable. And we, even as people of, or as people of God, but even even as non-believers, they see this and they realize how evil this is. Have you not considered that some are blinded by Satan to the gospel? 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Why? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Even you, believer, have you not um, found disruptions and interruptions to your obedience? You feel this pull. You, you have confusion in your study. You have distraction in your prayer. I'm not saying all of that is demonic, but I do believe uh, Satan and his demons attack and try to get us away from following Christ and try to get us away from focusing on his word. And they bring up things and, and, and tempt and, and move in ways that try to get us to pull away from him. I believe Satan is bound by the crushing power of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. I believe that Satan is bound and, and sin does not have reign on believers, but it would be foolish for me to say that Satan and his demons have no influence in this world. Now, I know there are others who don't believe in the way that I believe that Satan is bound, and that's okay. We can still have fellowship together, but we can also both take the power of evil seriously. 
as we should, as the word tells us we should. The demonic in this passage reveals sin and Satan's true desire for you, though. I hope that you see that. Not that everything is demonic, not that everything, every influence, every temptation is demonic, but it shows us sin and Satan's true desire for us. In Genesis 4-7, just after the fall, God tells um, Cain, If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. It wants to rule over you. Jesus tells us in John 10.10, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Those are his purposes. He did not come to bless. He didn't get, come to have give you life abundantly. Jesus came for that. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Peter tells us the same thing. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Why? Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. His desire is to devour you. John Owen writes in The Mortification of Sin, You know what sin did in David and in others. Every time sin rises to tempt or entice, it always seeks to express itself to the extreme. Every unclean thought or glance would be adult adultery if it could. Every covetous desire would be oppression. And every unbelieving thought would be atheism. It is like the grave that is never satisfied. That is Satan and sin's true desire for you. It will never be satisfied. It wants to rule over you. It wants to destroy you. Satan arrives in Genesis 3, and he arrives disguised as a friend. We read in the Word that Satan is a, he, he masks himself as an angel of light. He's beautiful. He says, look at this wonderful thing I have for you. But his intention is not to bless you. It is, it is to mount a full frontal attack on humanity. That's what he does in Genesis 3. He attacks humanity, the height of God's creation. He tax it. Satan hates God and he hates everything that bears God's image. So he attacks humanity that's made in the image of God to destroy what is beautiful, what God has made to reflect himself. His desire is nothing but hate and destruction for you. For now, the demonic will do all that it can to keep people from coming to Christ. Look at verses 32 and 33. Now, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on a hill, hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. You see, the demonic drove the man out of the town. It, it consumed him completely. It, he had no power over it. It, it he, had, he didn't even have clothes on. But the demonic, whenever Jesus drives them out, he tells them, you've got to go now. What they request is to go into the pigs, and this is why I, I believe they do so. Because they know they've already lost this man. Jesus has claimed him. He says, this man is mine. For he commanded, in verse 29, the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the de demon to the desert. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him to, to not command them to depart into the abyss. 
And then they ask to go into the pigs, and the demons go out of the man because Jesus commanded them into the pigs. So they knew, we can't go to this man. He's been claimed by Christ. Uh, Jesus has authority to free us from all that seeks to enslave us, even the ruler of this present darkness, even a legion of demons. But the demons knew, if, if we could just Get out and turn the town, the rest of, we've lost this man, but if we could turn the rest of the town away from Jesus, they know who he is. He says in verse 28, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Did you know, we've got to do something to keep the rest of the town from seeing this man as Jesus. So what can we do? Take us into the pigs so that we can create destruction. So that we can create fear. So that we can drive their eyes to losing all of these pigs and away from Jesus. And that's what Satan wants to do. If you're an unbeliever, he wants to use every circumstance, every situation, everything in life to turn your eyes away from Jesus so that you don't cry out to him. So that you don't come to him. So that he does not save you. And believer... Satan still wants to drive your eyes away, and he wants to use every situation to create fear in you. So church, we have to pray. We have to pray for the unbeliever that the blinding scales of Satan would fall off of their eyes and they cannot see the destruction, but see the Savior. They can see the Messiah. And as strong as the demonic is in this passage, as we look at it and we think, wow, look at all that it's done. It, it is, it's driven him out. It seized him. Um, and he says, what is your name? In verse uh, 30. And he says, legion, for many demons had entered him. Now, as, as strong as the demons are, they've done all of this stuff. And he says, our name is legion. So, um, we would say a, a legion of Roman soldiers, about 6,000 soldiers, um, they go into 2,000 pigs. So it, whatever the number is, there's this large amount of demon, demons that had entered him. For many demons, in verse 30, had entered him. But even though they're very powerful, even though they drive this man out of the town and even though there are 6,000 of them, they submit in fear to the authority of Jesus Christ. What have you to do with me? Leave me alone. I beg you, verse 28, do not torment me. What is your name? And he answers. They answer Jesus. They begged him, verse 31, not to command them to depart into the abyss. They obey. They beg him, verse 32, to let them enter into the pigs. He gives them permission. They have to ask him permission. So you see, they have to submit to the authority of Christ. Jesus Christ has all authority. Jesus has authority now. And he has authority in all of eternity. We see that they beg, do not cast us into the abyss. Do not cast us away. They beg him not to command them to depart into the abyss. This is a reference to Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3. I don't have time to cover that this morning. But you would do well to research what Christ's power is over the demonic. Now he can cast them out. He has that authority. He reigns now. And in all of eternity to cast them out forever. To destroy them. And child of God, I want you to know you do not have to live in fear. Even as powerful as the demonic is, you do not have to live in fear because Jesus has all authority to set us free from all that seeks to enslave us now and forevermore. I pray that you can rest in that. And he even has the authority to set us free from our own sinful hearts 
which is the second uh, thing we're going to look at. Because we need to see that our own sin and our own depraved hearts are to blame for turning away from Christ. Not only is Satan to blame, yes, he drives the man out and away from Jesus Christ, but we look at the rest of the town now, and we see that they are blinded by the effects of sin. James 1, 14 and 15 says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire." We're wicked in our own hearts. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin, um, it is fully grown, brings forth death. He doesn't even mention the demonic here. So we need to see that we are blinded by the effects of sin on our lives. In this passage, we see that sin leads to materialism. It's the love of possessions and money. The the herdsmen and the townspeople are blinded by materialism. I love bacon as much as the next person. Um, I love pork as much as the next person. But these people miss the importance of what has just happened before them. Look at verse 34. When the herdsmen saw that he had, what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. They were so blinded by losing their material wealth. There's 2,000 pigs, Mark tells us in Mark 5.13. They lost 2,000 pigs go over the cliff. They're so blinded by that tragedy of losing um, their material wealth that they fail to see that this demon-possessed man has been healed by the power of God, that he has cast out a legion of demons. Even though they talk about it, they are blind to how significant this this is. They are blind to the fact that Jesus is here to set the captive free, that he is the Messiah. He's in Luke 4, um, like I keep going back to Luke 4, 18 and 19, he says, this time is here. I'm here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He began to say, the scripture has been filled, fulfilled in your hearing. The Messiah is here, but they miss it. Mark 5, 16, they're talking about this, and they say, And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon, to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. Who cares about the pigs? They missed the Messiah. John Oxenham wrote a poem um, that tells us the heart of these uh, people well. Rabbi, Be gone. Thy powers bring loss to us and ours. Our ways are not as thine. Thou loves men, we swine. Oh, get you hence, omnipotence, and take this fool of thine. His soul? What care we for his soul? What good to us that thou hast made him whole? We have lost our swine. This is like the parable of the rich man. He comes to Jesus and he sees this miraculous going on, but he cannot follow Jesus because he had to give up the material possessions he had grown to love. What about you? Has your material possessions kept you from coming to Christ? What if I have to give up all of this? What if I lose this? Mark 8 36 tells us, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? We have been called not to a comfortable life. That's what Satan wants us to see. 
Just be comfortable. Get everything that you want. Do what makes you feel good. But we've not been called to that. We've been called to a life of sacrifice, not of selfish salvation, but to the ministry of reconciliation. God has given us this ministry to follow him, to take up our cross, to die to ourselves and follow him. But sin creates this longing within us to to want to have all of this, to be pleased. Sin also blinds us with fear. Verse 35 tells us, Luke 8, 35, Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And then in verse 37, All the people of the surrounding country of Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got in the boat and left. These people, when they lost their 2,000 pigs, took a massive financial blow. Perhaps they drove Jesus away because they were afraid that if he didn't leave, they were going to lose more. Perhaps they were afraid that if he didn't leave, he was going to ask them to follow him, that he was going to ask them to leave. He was going to ask them to turn back to faithfulness towards God because this, this country, uh, this portion of the country is known to be a Gentile and Jewish uh, where they mix. So they were kind of looked down upon. But if these are Jewish farmers, it is unlawful for Jews to be farming pigs. We see that in Leviticus 11, 7, and 8. And the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed but does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. You shall not eat any of their flesh. You shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. So maybe Jesus is calling them back. So they have this fear. If he, if he doesn't leave, we're going to either lose more of our stuff or he's going to call us to turn from this life, this very profitable life, and follow him. And we don't want that. So has fear kept you from following Jesus? Are you afraid you're going to miss out on something? You're going to, are you afraid you're going to have to give up something? That you're not going to be rich or you're not going to be able to hold on to this pet sin or, or whatever it is. What is keeping you from following Jesus? Because whatever it is, whatever has got you gripped in fear and keeping you from that is an empty promise. Just think of what Satan offers in Genesis 3 and how it fractures the rest of humanity. Just think about what Satan offers Judas. 30 pieces of silver and how he realizes he betrayed the Son of God for material possessions. Sin gives us, it blinds us with fear. What am I going to lose? What if I have to do this? What if I have to do that? Sin also makes us blind to salvation. Romans 1, 24 and 25 tells us in verse 18, it tells us uh, the wrath of God is coming. Um, and he, in verses 24 and 25, it says that it's, we see that God gives them up to the lusts of their own heart and impurity to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchange the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We are blinded to salvation because we have exchanged what we know is true about God and worship ourselves, the creature, or the things around us rather than God. Just as they do here, they reject Jesus, all the people of the surrounding country asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So they get, he got into the boat and returned. He leaves. He leaves and there's no evidence that he ever returns to this region. May it not be said of you this morning that you were in the presence of the one who could save you and you turned your back on him 
and you traded the eternal for the temporary, that you exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and you worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is to be blessed forever. Amen. I implore you to turn to Jesus this morning, to sit at his feet, to learn from him, to follow him, just as the man in this passage does, and experience the freeing power of Jesus Christ. Jesus frees this demon-possessed man. Verse 35, we see that they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind, he was freed from demon possession. Jesus set him, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus set him free. He is now drawn to Jesus instead of drawn away from him. He is now sitting at his feet instead of yelling out against him. He's able to hear him. He's in his right mind. He can hear the words of life. He can understand the gospel. He can obey his creator now because he's been set free. The cloud of darkness surrounding his mind has now been lifted. He's free from that which blinded him. And you can be free also. Free from all that pulls you away from Jesus. Free from all that clouds your mind. Free to receive the word of life and follow him. It's not complicated. Sit at the feet of Jesus. And you know what's awesome about this passage? The man didn't come to Jesus. Jesus went to the man. He crossed the lake for this man. And he told him, he set him free, and he left. Jesus descended from heaven. He became man, put on flesh to make salvation possible for you and for me. He's communicating his word to you right now. Come to me, he's saying. Be set free. And Christian, you too. This isn't just for the lost. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is still saving you from all that keeps you down. All the anger, all the hate, all the impatience, the lust, the addiction, the pride, the idolatry, the, the materialism, the fear. He's, he's setting you free. You have to sit at your master's feet though. You have to hear his words. You have to submit to him. He has come to give you life abundantly. And Jesus frees us from, from shame. We read in the text, this man was without clothes for a long time. For a long time he wore no clothes in verse 27. Living in shame of his nakedness. Being driven out. Clothes torn off. But now church he's clothed and he's in his right mind and Jesus covered his shame just as God covers the shame of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 21 and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them he sacrificed an animal to cover their shame and this covering of shame is not only in front of others. It's the shame of sin, of us turning our backs on God. That's why Adam and Eve ran from God and hid. Because they were ashamed. They were guilty. They knew they couldn't stand in front of God because they, their sin was exposed. And Jesus clothes our shame by telling us we're worth dying for. He becomes that animal. He becomes the lamb that's slain to cover us while we were still sinners. He, he covers our shame. He covers our spiritual shame by dying on the cross and paying for it himself. He is nailed in front of all all of the crowd. He becomes the naked one with no clothes outside the city like this demon-possessed man so that we don't have to be. 
Jesus becomes the cursed one. So that we don't have to be. Some of you are ashamed of your sin. Ashamed of where you have landed in life. Ashamed you're outcast and you think there's no hope for me. But will you look at this man in the passage? Will you look at his desperate condition? In Mark, we see just a different picture that Jesus had stepped out of the boat and there's a man that met him out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often bound with he was often bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Look at his desperate situation. He no one could help him. He was cutting himself with stones, ashamed of what he had become. But Jesus sets him free. And Jesus can set you free. There's no one who's too far gone. None who are too sinful. None that are too possessed. He has all authority. He has the authority to set you free from all that enslaves you. Come to Jesus this morning and be set free of your shame. Be set free of your sin. Jesus frees us also from mental oppression. Satan binds the mind of the unbeliever to the gospel, but the word of Jesus can destroy that hold. Believer, you have allowed things in this world to hinder your ability to think or to practice the things of God. You've allowed social media or TV or games or phone or, or whatever it is in your life that dulls your mind. But turn to Jesus, repent and turn to him and sit at his feet. Fight with the power of the Spirit within you. You've been set free. Stop allowing Satan to lie to you that you can't do this. Well, you can't, but Jesus can through you. You're freed from the meaningless life. This man was cast into meaninglessness, bound to the desert. He could not hold down a job. He couldn't make money. He couldn't even keep clothes on. The herdsmen were just the opposite, making tons of money, doing everything right. But it was all for nothing if that's the end in itself. You can make all the money in the world and never truly reach your purpose in life. You can find that at the end of your life, you have visited all the world. You've had all the toys. You've had all of the fun. But you never made an influence for the kingdom of God. Our purpose is to point to the Lord, to glorify the, the Lord, to tell others of His glory and what He has done for us. And how tragic would it be to come to the end of our lives, to approach the throne of the King of Kings, and instead of telling him how we um, shared his mercy and we told others of his grace and pointed to his kingdom, we all we have to show is totally focused on ourselves. Jesus sets us free from a meaningless life. The man was set free and he begged to follow Jesus. Verse 38, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. He knew now to live as Christ. To live as Christ I have no other purpose than to bring glory to this King of Kings, the one who has authority over all. He had experienced salvation, and now he could only say, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I want to do your will. Jesus gives meaning to an otherwise meaningless life. 
but we're free to evangelize. Free to go and tell all that God has done for us in verse 39. And he does. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. You see, this man was transformed. He knew Jesus and he told everyone, I've been set free. And if you've experienced the saving power of Jesus Christ, if you've experienced the deliverance from sin, the freedom from addiction, why would you not tell others? Why would you not give them that hope? You're set free to go do so. Finally, Jesus sets us free to be who we were created to be. Imago Dei, that we were created in the image of God, created to reflect Him. One of the earlier church fathers, Tertullian, once wrote, The glory of God is man fully alive. But we're not fully alive until we've experienced the saving power of Jesus Christ. So when we arrived at this passage, we saw a man who was naked, who was ashamed, who was tormented and lost. And we can see ourselves in that situation. We can see maybe not that we've been naked and tormented and in, in, in the hills and cutting ourselves with rocks, but we've seen that sin has similar effects on us. That it exposes us naked and in our guilt. That we understand we're sinners before a holy God. It alienates us from one another. It leaves us lonely and alone. We we. We try to please ourselves and push others away. We become violent, at least in our attitudes, if not in our actions. Spiritually speaking, we walk among the dead. Ephesians 2.1, as Ken preached last week. So the madman in the graveyard shows our wretchedness of our condition outside of Christ. My desire is that you would turn to Jesus and find freedom. Come to know the one who gave it all to purge evil from this world on the cross. It was costly so that we might become the sons and daughters of the king. Come to Jesus this morning if you haven't. If you're lost, come to him. If you're a believer, come to Jesus. Sit at his feet. Receive his mercy and his grace and his healing. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you for your mercy, for your power, your authority over the spiritual realm, that you uh, are our Savior. I pray that as we look at this story, we see the, the hopelessness of this man, that if any of us are outside of Christ, that we would see we're in that same position and we would come to you. As you come to us, I pray that you make those um, aware of your word who are blind right now. That you would remove the scales of Satan on the unbeliever's eyes so that they could see you, Jesus. For those of us who um, know you, I pray that we are still sitting at your feet. We're still going and telling others of all that God has done for us. I pray that we're not hiding this or we're not reverting back to materialism or, or sin um, that has bound us before. I pray that we understand we're free in you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and grace towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemed? There is no more forever now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and free. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
thy side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hope my shepherd will be. Amen. Let us end with the benediction from Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go and be the church.